right? So, I was struggling for a while on what uh, what I was going to preach because I had all of March planned out. I knew what I was going to do and got to the end of March and I thought, I don't have the first uh, Sunday of April planned, so I scrambled. Um, and I was led, uh, I believe, by the Lord to a passage in Matthew. It will go to Matthew chapter 23 if you have your Bibles. I would invite you to Matthew chapter 23. And uh, we'll get into it in just a minute. It's the very end of Matthew 23, it's verses 37 through 39. Um, but we're going to talk about hens, chicks, and wings today. And you're probably all wondering, what on earth does all of that have to do uh, with God, with Jesus, with the Bible, with whatever. Well, we're going to be exploring uh, the protective urge of God today. And once we get into the passage, you'll understand why hens, chicks, and wings, and how they sort of become important in all of this. So, uh, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, uh, verses 37 through 39. Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39. Uh, all right, now this is Jesus speaking. Uh, it's actually, it, it comes at the, the end of a much, much, much longer uh, speech than just this little section that we're going to be in today. But in the, in the speech, that the whole speech that he gives, it's this huge warning that he's given. He's, he's in the city of Jerusalem. This is towards the end of his life. Okay, this is sometime within the last, the, the last week of his life. Uh, he's in Jerusalem. He's, he's basically preparing for his death, which he knows is coming. And at this point, this long speech is he's speaking to the religious establishment. Okay, He's speaking to the people who run the religious life of the nation of Israel. And that's why he's in Jerusalem, because that's the center of, uh, of Jewish life. Jewish religious life, Jewish political life, all of that comes mixed together in this one city that we call Jerusalem, uh, whose name ironically means the city of peace. Uh, Jeru Shalom. Jeru is city. Shalom is peace in the Hebrew. Uh, and if you know anything about the city of Jerusalem, you know that throughout its entire history, it is anything but a city of peace. It, it, it is anything but peaceful. That There, there are all kinds of revolts, there are all kinds of wars, there are all kinds of violence and, and treachery and betrayal and all of this sort of stuff that goes on at the, at the highest echelons of Israel's political and religious life. And Jesus then steps into this powder keg of Jerusalem where all of these, these different factions and sects and all of this fighting is going on, and he steps into the middle of this to speak a word of warning to the people who are in charge. And so when Jesus is giving this huge long speech, he's speaking to the people in charge. Okay, He's speaking to the priests, to the, to the religious elite of the nation of Israel. Remember, Jesus is Jewish, he's an Israelite, and that's who he comes to initially. So this is how he ends the speech, starting in verse 37. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who, who are sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now there's all kinds of stuff in this. And there are a couple of things that I just want to give you a little bit of a background to what's going on. He uses this, this image of a hen and, their, and uh, this hen's chicks and, and uh, just kind of overshadowing these chicks. With, with her wings. And this is a protective sort of image. It's a, it's a picture of protection. Um, Jesus is, is he's expressing his anguish over Jerusalem's history and its future. He says, this is, this is who you have been in the past. That's how he starts out. He goes, you, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who have killed the prophets 
you who have stoned those who have been sent to you. This is, this, is how he be, this is how he ends this speech to these religious leaders, to these people who are in charge. This would be like walking into Capitol Hill and saying, you, you brood of vipers, you evil, murdering, foolish people, this is what's wrong. You are what's wrong. It would be just like somebody walking into the Capitol, walking into the White House, and pointing to all of the important people in charge and going, you are what's wrong with this nation. Would that go over well? Not so much. You know, if you were to try to do that, like if you were to try to get within, like, just a few feet of the president and start talking to him this way, within moments you would be tackled to the ground. You'd, you'd be put down pretty quick. And Jesus comes, and this is what he does. He's a bit of a troublemaker. He goes in, and, and he starts naming names, he starts pointing fingers, and he starts saying, you guys have got this screwed up. It is you. This is our history, Jerusalem. This is our history. This is who we are, and this is your future. It is the same as your history. You who have killed those that God has sent to you with this message. Uh, uh, of hope, of peace, of life, of transformation. You have killed these people. And he knows that he's next. Uh, if you read through the Gospels, and if you read through several of the parables of Jesus, you will see that he has this understanding that he is the last in a great long line of prophets, of people who come to warn the people what God is about to do and to tell them what God wants them to do and that what's going to happen to him is exactly what happened to the previous prophets. If you read through the Bible, you will find that prophets are not treated very well. Uh, the, the, the bit that we read for our scripture reading comes from the book of Lamentations, which was written by a prophet named Jeremiah. He's often called the weeping prophet because... Uh, his whole prophecy of this huge book of Jeremiah and the short book of Lamentations is characterized by lament, is characterized by tragedy, by uh, things not going how he thinks they should go. And he's often complaining to God and saying, God, these people that you're sending me to, they're not going to listen to me. And then he goes to them, see, I told you they didn't listen to me. And they take him and they throw him in a pit and they mistreat him and they do all sorts of bad stuff. And that's just like a taste of what happens to the prophets. And this is Jesus, okay? This is the Son of God. And he is the, the last in the great line of prophets. And he steps into this powder keg called Jerusalem where anything could happen. And he starts pointing fingers and naming names. You guys, this is your history, and this is exactly where you're going. What happened before to Jerusalem? Uh, you can read about it in the book of Lamentations. You can read about it in uh, all over the Old Testament. That's going to happen again if you don't knock it off. If you don't turn and repent and go back to the way God has called you to, it's going to happen again. This is what he's saying. Uh, we know that in uh, the year 70 A.D., so roughly uh, 37 odd years after Jesus, uh, after he dies and is resurrected and all of that again, the, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. The city of Jerusalem is destroyed. It's, uh, the Romans have finally had enough, and they say, no more. We're not going to put up with this rebellion. We're not going to put up with this revolution. We're going to crush you. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, so they reject him. They reject God. They reject his messengers, the prophets. And now Jesus, the last in the great line, comes with a final warning for this city of Jerusalem, for this establishment. He indicates Israel's future doesn't look any better. And the image that he gets, he says, how I have longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But your house will be left desolate to you. The image that he gives here is of a farmyard fire that rages, that blazes, and that all you find after the fire is consumed is a scorched, blackened, dead hen with live chicks under her wings. That's the image that he gives. How I have longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks 
under her wings. This is a protective move, a protective image. God wants to protect his people. He says, I have longed to do this again and again and again and again with you, Israel, but you would not listen. You would not come under my protective wings. You would not be protected by me. And so you burn as well. The fire comes and it consumes you as well. I wanted to protect you, but you wouldn't let me. You wouldn't let me. And then he says, so your house has been left desolate to you. Now the word house is kind of an important word here. Because if you study the book of, uh, you know, if you study the Old Testament, you will find the house often refers to the temple. Uh, it was kind of the central structure in Jewish life. It was you, you made several trips to the temple throughout your year. You would go there for festivals. You would go there um, for cleansing. You would go there for all kinds of important activities. The temple was the place where essentially heaven and earth overlapped. It was the place that you went to to meet with God and to be redeemed by God. And you had to do all kinds of sacrifices and all kinds of rituals and all kinds of cleansing. But it was, it was absolutely central to the Jewish understanding of how they lived and how they moved and how they had their identity in the world was bound up in this one location, this temple. And this is what Jesus says, your house will be left to you desolate. That's part of the image of the farmyard fire, is that it consumes even the farm. The, the, even the barn where the chicks and the hen stay is burned to the ground. That, that place that is central, that place of refuge, that place they go for cleansing, for healing, for prayer, for all kinds of things, that will be taken from them. That is Jesus' promise to Jerusalem. That is Jesus' promise to these people who have generation after generation after generation rejected him. And finally, he comes in person to them. And he says, here I am. I, I'm what you've been waiting for. I am your Messiah. I am your Deliverer. I am God in human flesh. I have come to take you, to redeem you, to care for you, to remove oppression from you. And what do they do? They kill him. They kill him. They nail him to a cross. That's what they do with their Savior. And I would, I would also point out this. That's what we do with the Savior as well. Because it's not just like we can point to one small group of people in history and say, well, it's their fault. Because we've had a tendency to do that in, in Christian history. So we've had a tendency to say, oh, well, it was the Jews' fault. Or maybe it was the Romans' fault. Well, I wasn't there. If I would have been there, you know what? If we would have been there, we would have done the same thing. We would have done exactly the same thing. We would have. Because somebody comes charging into our world, pointing fingers at us and saying, you're part of the problem. We want to nail him to a tree as well. We don't like to hear that. If we would have been there, we would have done the same thing. And, and theologically speaking, we are responsible for his death because it is our sin that he died to cover if we did not have this problem within each of us, he wouldn't have had to die. Each of us, in essence, if we, do not, uh, if we do not believe, if we do not trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation, are guilty of murder. His murder. Because that's a sin too. And that sin is taken away in Jesus. If we place our faith and our trust in Him, then we have that taken away. We are not responsible for that. But if we choose not to believe... That is another charge laid against us. We are guilty of his murder. We are guilty of killing, of <clears throat> nailing Jesus Christ to the cross. Of handing him over to the people who did it. That is who we are. Because that is who they are. People are people, whether it's 2,000 years ago or 2,000 years from now. People are still people and we have the same problems. 
you know, those problems don't change. We, we all have these problems throughout history. We are all jealous. We all betray each other. We all lie. We, we all have these tendencies, these urges within us, this sin within us, which is what draws us further and further away from God. But what is the urge of God? What is the urge of God? Well, we see it pretty clearly demonstrated here. What does he say to them? I have longed, I have desired, I have ached to gather you to me. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings for protection. That is his desire. And we see him act this out in the cross. And their house is left historically desolate to them. To Jerusalem. When the Romans have had enough. When they say, no more. They have a, a very difficult time understanding how they're going to continue being faithful to God's word, to the law, to the Torah, after the temple is destroyed, because it's so central to their life. It is so central to them. Uh, historically, after 70 AD, the Jews had a hard time figuring out how to do that, how they could fulfill the law's commands, because they don't have a place to bring their sacrifices anymore. They don't know how to do it. Well... God commands us to bring our, our, our lamb to the temple for Passover, but there's no more temple. How, how do we do this? How do we do this? Imagine having the most cherished thing in your life, whether it's a person, a house, a car, whatever, just violently ripped from you. How do you react to that? Multiply that by about a million, and that's how the Jews feel about the temple being taken from them. So they don't know how to live without this. They, they don't know what to do. And they, they meet, you know, a little while later, they meet about 70 years after the fact, and they try to come up with a system, well, maybe instead we'll of doing these sacrifices, do really nice things for each other, we'll try to do these really great works and all these really nice things for each other, these, uh, these, these Jews who are trying to be faithful to the Bible, uh, and they come up with this system, but they don't, they don't know how to answer it. And they're, they're even, they even have problems about some of the, the solutions that they came up with. And Jesus actually answers, or offers an answer that falls on their deaf ears. What does he say? If you go to John chapter 2 sometime, you don't have to do it right now, but if you go to John chapter 2, when Jesus walks into the temple, and he starts overturning the money changers' temples, and it says he fashions a, a whip out of cords, and whips people out of the temple, and says, you should not be doing this, my father's house is a house of prayer. And then they ask him, by what authority do you do this? Who gives you the right to come in here and do this to us? And his response is this. He says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will rebuild it. No, and they don't understand what he's talking about. Goes, Wait a minute, this, this took us like 40 odd years to rebuild this temple. How can you possibly rebuild it in three days? And then John makes a comment in the Gospel of John about what he means. He goes, he's not talking about the temple. He's talking about his body. Jesus is the new temple. He says, in three days, because that's what happens after he dies, isn't it? In three days, what happens? He rises. He rises. It is the restored temple. If you go all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, which is also written by John, written by the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John and a couple of other letters we have in the New Testament, what do we see? We see this brilliant city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And John gives this description of this city. And he says, uh, well, there's this over here, and it's got this river running through it, and on the sides of the river are these trees with... Uh, the trees of life and their leaves are for the healing of the nations. And then he makes a note about something that is missing. He says, but in this city there is no temple. For the Lamb is the temple. For Jesus Christ himself is the temple. And Jesus says to these people, he says to them presently, he goes, you know, I've longed to gather you as a hen gathers chicks to herself under her wings to protect them from the fire that's coming. He says, I longed to do that, but your house, your temple, your temple will be left, left desolate 
to you. It's going to be gone. It's going to be destroyed. And you're not going to know what to do. He told them they're not going to know what to do. But then he says, I'm the new temple. You want a temple, you come to me. You want to meet God, you come to me. You want to go to the place where heaven and earth overlap, you come to me. I am the new temple. You need to come to me. I'm the one you've been waiting for. This temple, he says, this is, this is just a shadow of me. I cast this shadow. You've been waiting for me, not the shadow. You've been waiting for the object which casts the shadow. But they're so concerned about the shadow that they aren't even noticing the one who is casting it. He says, this is what I've longed to do for you the whole time. And then the passage ends with verse 39, uh, which is a quotation from Psalm 118, verse 26. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Hebrew in Psalm for blessed is he who comes uh, actually literally means, if you want to translate it, simply means welcome. He says to them, uh, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He says, you will not see me again until you welcome me. Until you're ready to welcome me, you don't get to see me again. I'm the one you've been waiting for, and until you're ready to welcome me, you don't get to see me. Which is pretty ironic, because when Jesus first enters Jerusalem, during what we call the triumphal entry, that little scene in several of the Gospels where Jesus rides on a donkey and they're laying down palm branches, which today is Palm Sunday, that, that time when he rides in, uh, they're, they're cheering for him, Hosanna, Hosanna. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They welcome him, but within a few days, they turn on him. He goes, you're not going to see me again until you say that, and you mean it. You don't get to see me again until you can mean that. It's not enough just to speak that. It's not enough just to give lip service and to say the words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's not enough. You have to actually mean it and welcome me on purpose. Now, one of the lessons that we can learn as far removed observers of this, one of the lessons that we can learn is that within God there is this protective urge. There's this protective urge that God has. Um, here Jesus uses the image of a hen's wings. Wings are kind of important imagery in the Bible because they're usually... Um, about protection when they're used in reference to God. Sometimes you will hear about uh, um, eagles' wings. And one of the passages I'm going to take you to in a second here, Will. Uh, the first time wings shows up in the entire Bible is in Exodus 19. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them up to Exodus 19. Exodus 19, verse 4. Exodus 19, verse 4. And this is, he's, God is speaking to the Israelites from the mountain, from Sinai, just after he's delivered them from Egypt. And this is what he says. Exodus 19, verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Wings. The first time wings shows up in the Bible is uh, in a protective expression of God. He says, I protected you from the Egyptians. I delivered you from the Egyptians. I carried you out of that torment. I carried you out of that uh, oppression. And you have been protected by me. I carried you on eagles' wings. Again, God employs the image of a bird's wings to describe his protective posture toward his people. But let's go deeper. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let's open up to the very last book of the Old Testament. So right before Matthew, we find the... Uh, the prophet Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. It's only four chapters long. It's a short one. We're just going to read verses 1 through 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 2. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. And this is another passage about warning. Okay, there's a warning here. But this is how he starts it. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, so more fire imagery, when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, 
the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. With healing in its wings. Now, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, the Hebrew word for wings is the word kanaf. Let me hear you say kanaf. Kanaf. Uh, kanaf actually has a couple of different meanings to it. Now, in uh, the book of Numbers, let me backtrack a little bit. In the book of Numbers, Moses, God tells Moses to command the people, I want you, I want you to give this command to the people so that they can remember my commandments and statutes, so that they can remember the law that I give to them. I want you to tell them to make tassels and put these tassels on the corners of their garments. And so what eventually happened was, they, uh, they developed this. Do you know what this is? Yeah, this is a Hebrew prayer shawl. Okay, it would be worn like this. And God tells them to do this because God is a God of visuals. Okay, God is a God of visuals. He's a God who basically tells his people, if you're going to remember this, you're going to need something to help you. Okay, he doesn't just simply leave it to them to say, okay, here's this word, remember this word. He gives them something to remember. So he has them... Uh, create these tassels to put on their garments. Okay? And on these tassels, and this is what he's talking about, this is, this is how it's evolved, um, this is called a tzitzit. Okay? And there are these five little knots in the tzitzit. One, two, three, four, five. And each of these knots represents one of the books of the, of, uh, of the Torah. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So what you would do as a Hebrew, as a Jewish person, is as you would pray... You would, you, would, you would have these, this tangible thing, and that you would, you would feel it. Not only would you think of the Word of God, but you would, you would have this thing that would help to remind you. And what God tells Moses to command the people is to take these tassels and put them on the corner of your garment. The corner of your garment. Guess what the Hebrew word for corner is? Kanaf. It's the exact same word for wings. And if you were to, if you were to see a, a, a Jewish person, and they still use these things, if you were to see a Jewish person use these things and walk around, you could see the idea of how they get the image of wings from this, couldn't you? This was a Hebrew prayer shawl. Now, if you go to the book of Luke, let's go to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 44. This is review for some of you, um, but never hurts to review. And for some of you, this is going to be a little new. So Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 44. Luke chapter 8, and I'm in John, so that doesn't make any sense. Luke chapter 8, you guys got there ahead of me, didn't you? Uh, verses 40 through 44. Now, when Jesus Return, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter who was about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for about 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Now that's fascinating to me on a number of levels. What does she touch? What does she touch that heals her? Kanaf. What does Malachi say? For you who fear the name of the Lord, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its kanaf, in its wings, in the corner of the garment. So this woman believes I mean, because you would think it would just be sort of odd for somebody to, to just walk up to Jesus and expect, you know, to, to come up with this on their own. If I maybe touch the, 
corner of his garment, I'll be healed. She comes up with that because she knows Malachi. She knows what Malachi says. She knows because there's this tradition which developed, this tradition which developed, that the, there were a certain amount of people who believed that the, the actual physical prayer shawl, Jesus would have worn one of these. Okay? Jewish males wore these when they went to prayer. And sometimes they just wore them all over the place. And so this tradition developed from Malachi 4 that when the Messiah came, the Son of Righteousness, that within his, his wings, his kanaf, his prayer shawl, he would have healing powers. And that's why the woman approaches him and touches him. So what do we know about the image of the kanaf, of the, of the corner, of the wings? When we, when we encounter the word wings in Scripture, what do we think? We think of protection, we think of healing, we think of restoration, we think of covering, we think of uh, this protective urge that God has toward his people. God desires to protect his people. The protective, sheltering, restoring wings of God are always on offer to the people who trust to the people who believe to the, in the person and the accomplishments of the Lord Jesus. And why did I throw this picture up there? The miracle on the Hudson, as some of it, uh, some people are referring to it. Because what do we see? Well, how are these people being protected? On wings. On wings. This is, this is how God speaks of himself and of, of his desire and his movement and his urge toward his creation, humanity, as he wants to protect them with his wings. And that serves as a pretty nice metaphor, I think, for how God reveals himself in this passage in Matthew. How I have longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. I have longed to protect you. When we finally come to the realization that we don't have it all together, when we finally come to a place where we're ready to submit, that we can't get life nailed down the way we want to, we see our need for something much larger than ourselves. That we can't do this. That I can't make it on my own. It's like when you were a little kid and you thought you could do anything. Does anybody have any like specific... Uh, recall of when you were young and you thought you could do something until you painfully discovered that you could not? <clears throat> I've got a couple of these memories. One in particular. I was in, I don't know, maybe second grade, first grade, second grade, kindergarten, something like that. And they had us all lined out uh, outside and we were just going to do a race. Uh, I don't know why they were doing it. I have no recollection of the purpose of this. I just remember them lining us up and, and having us race and run from one spot to another. And I can recall in my mind thinking, I am going to be the fastest person out here today. And it turned out that I was the slowest person <laughs> out there that day. So we have these images sometimes uh, that, that we can do things that we can't do, and something will occasionally come along which will shatter those images and show us that perhaps we were a little wrong about that. When we get to a place like that, where we see that we don't have life nailed down, we are ready to submit ourselves to something much bigger than ourselves. We are ready to come under the sheltering wings, the protective wings. Of the God who desires protected. Now you may say, yes, but. Great, that, that's nice, but. They still rejected him. Didn't they? I mean, the temple is still destroyed in 70 AD. Well, what good did it do for him to come? Well, what, what was, what's the big deal? I mean, yeah, true. True. The temple is destroyed in 70 AD. But that was the plan. That was the design. That was what he promised would happen. And yet he died for them and for us anyway, didn't he? He 
like a mother hen took the encroaching fire in the cross on himself. Because that's where the real danger was, in death. So that anyone who believes, who trusts in him, does not have to deal with the death problem in the same way as they would have. He takes that fire on himself, and those who believe are put under his healing, restoring, protective wings. And he saves us. Just like in that, that image where you have this scorched, blackened hen, but under her wings are live chicks. Under the wings of the mighty Savior, Jesus Christ, we find living, breathing people who are saved, who are protected from the ultimate touch of death. He did this for a rebellious, rejecting people who think mostly of themselves, which would be us. God's crowning creation, humanity, had walked away from him and walked away from his design, and yet, how does he move toward us? He still moves in this protective urge. He still moves toward us protectively. He still shelters us and tries to cover us with his wings. Why does, this, why, why does he do this? We don't deserve this. I mean, we don't do anything to merit this, to earn this protection and salvation. Why does he do this? For the same reason that a secret service agent will step in front of a bullet for the president. Because that secret service agent values the life of the president above his own. Why does God step in front of the cross for us? Because he values us. Even though we in rebellion and rejection... And sin, walk away from him, he steps in front of the cross for us. Because he loves us. He values us. He wants the best for us. So he provides a way for us. He gives us the cross to protect us. Regardless of our rejection, Jesus still and constantly moves toward us protectively. Because even after we are saved, we have this tendency, don't we? To want to keep doing things our own way. To want to keep doing things the way that we think will work out best for us. His protection is restorative. It offers healing from the rejection epidemic. Aside from removing the penalty of our sin, Jesus' cross also begins the process of removing the power of sin in our life. Where sin keeps coming back and saying, no, 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 you want to do this your way. Now you'll enjoy this a lot more than God's way. Jesus still continuously steps in front of that for us and says, no, I took that on me on the cross. Come back. Come back under my wings. Come back under my protection. Come back, come back, come back come back. He continuously offers us the wing. He keeps offering it to us. The cross of Christ teaches us that following him means to lay down armaments and arguments at the cross. Stop the rebellion and take shelter under the wings like chicks do with a hen. So as we walk toward Easter, let us ask this question. Is your Messiah too small? Is your Jesus too small? Do you have this tunnel vision version of Jesus in your mind? That, that you keep him in your back pocket and you pull him out when you think you need him. Well, all the while he is trying to step in front of things for you and divert you away from paths that will harm you. Is your Messiah, is your Jesus too small? You see, the people of Jerusalem were waiting for the Messiah and they were waiting eagerly for the Messiah. They were ready to be done with oppression. 
because they've been oppressed throughout their whole history. And they were ready for, for the Messiah to come and to do something about it. But they were ready for him to come on their own terms, on their own schedule, in their own way. And Jesus defies all of their categories. And we should not be surprised to find that he defies pretty much all of our categories too. Is your Jesus too small? Is he too small? Do you picture him as this little meek, you know, we, we talk about gentle Jesus, meek and mild, whatever. Yeah, go ahead. I was driving down the road the other day and there was a sign outside a church and it's one of my ba ba yeah. favorite things to read the church sign. Anyway, it said, are you using Jesus as your steering wheel or your spare tire? Nice. Yeah, are you using Jesus as your steering wheel or your spare tire? Exactly. Absolutely. Is your Jesus too small? Are you keeping him in the trunk for just maybe when you need him? Is he, is he just a kind of an accessory? Or, or is he the engine even, I would say? Does he drive you? Is your Jesus too small? Is he too small? We put him, sometimes we think, under our wings and pull him out when we need him. Or do we say, no, I, I can't do this. I, I don't have the strength, I don't have the power, I don't have the ability to do this. I need his wings. I need to come under his wings, under his shelter, under his restore, restoration, under his protection. I need him. He doesn't need us. The miracle is that he wants us. That's the true miracle here. It's not that Jesus needs us, but that he wants us. There's this great line in the Gospel of Mark when it talks about Jesus calling uh, his disciples to them. It says, he called to him those that he wanted. What does it look like to be wanted by God? Well, it looks like a cross. And a naked, bloody man named Jesus dying on it for our sins and rising again from the tomb. That's what it looks like for God to want us, to call us to Him. It's this attitude, the, the attitude that we put Jesus under our wing and pull Him out when we need Him or we think we need Him. It's this attitude that causes God's people to reject Jesus even to this day. It causes us to reject Him from time to time. Not that we can ever fully reject him. He says, nothing will snatch you out of my hand. Not, not even you can do that. You're not that strong. But, but we, 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 we try to push him away. You know, He steps in front of us like a secret service agent steps in front of the president and an oncoming bullet. But sometimes we just try to, eh, I'm trying to see here, Jesus. Can I, can I just get you to move? Sometimes we do that. Sometimes that's how we act to him. Sometimes we'll say, no, I want to do this my way. Now, we may not intentionally say, Jesus, I'm not going to follow you today, but that's functionally sometimes how we act. We say it when we worry about the Dow Jones. We say it when we worry about whether or not we can get our friends to do the things that we want them to do. When we plot, when we plan, when we scheme and assume things are going to go our way. We push Jesus out of the way. Every day we do this. And, and we simply have to get to a point where we say, you know what? This isn't working for me. This isn't working. I need his wings. He doesn't need mine. So, let's ask ourselves a few questions. Because all the while, Jesus is calling us out of worry, out of plotting, out of trying to run our life in our small-minded ways and into his wings. Let's ask ourselves, in what ways have I continuously rejected the God who moves protectively towards me? How do I do this on a daily basis to say, eh, can you just get out of the way for a second? I want to do this. In what ways have I continuously rejected the God, the Jesus, who moves protectively toward me? Because we do. How about this one? Today, today, what is God trying to step in front of for me? 
but I keep pushing him back out of the way. Today, what is he trying to step in front of? How, how is he trying to get in between you and me and the danger that we put ourselves in and the danger that comes our way? What is he trying to step in front of for you today? What is he trying to step in front of? Maybe it's something small, but it's still painful. Maybe it's something big. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's something that you just can't seem to get away from. Maybe it's sin itself. Maybe if you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus for his uh, life-giving blood that he shed for you on the cross. If you're here today and you've never trusted, Jesus is trying to step in front of that for you and offer you his resurrection and offer you eternal life. What is he trying to step in front of for you today, but we keep pushing him out of the way? Where have I most clearly seen God's sheltering wings in the past, covering me from the hurt I get myself into? Because it's, it's not just all about the negative. It's not just all about the stuff that, we, that we're total screw-ups, that we just can't seem to get anything right. It's not just about that. It's also about the victories that we can celebrate. It's about the things that we can clearly point to and look back and say, dodge that bullet. What, what ways can you point to and say, you know what? That hurt at the time, but it was really for the best. I, I was planning to do this. This was my goal. This was my scheme. This was my plot. But it, 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 Jesus just seemed to take it away. And I didn't understand it at the time. Jesus, I need that. Where are you going with it? Come back. And then today, you look back and you go, man, I would have been dumb if I did that. What are, what are the victories that you can celebrate? That you can say, yes, God stepped in front of that for me. He, he took that out of my path. He moved me to a different path. He brought victory in my life that I can celebrate right now. I can praise God because of it. What are the victories you can celebrate? Because God calls us not simply out of sin, but He calls us into victory. He calls us into His, his sheltering, protective, and restoring, healing, kanaf wings. That's victory. That's a win. Mark it up. That's a win. God calls us to victory in Jesus. So, so look at these questions and ask yourself, you know, how can I answer these? Well, what is my response to these questions? What can I say that, that, that God in His time has protected me from? What can I point to and say, you know, maybe, maybe Jesus is trying to step in front of that for me today. But what can I point to and say, you know what, this is, this, is, this is where I failed in the past. This is something that I need to work on and say, Jesus, yeah, I'm going to let you step in front of that for me tomorrow and today and right now. Because God is offering you his wings. He's offering you his protection. Because this is, this is the urge of God, the God who loves the God who creates, the God who makes good things, is He wants good for us, His creation. And when bad comes our way, the wing is ready to cover. Let's pray. God, we just thank You so much for Your protection. We thank You so much for Your wings, for Your healing that You give to us. We thank You so much that You have given to us Jesus Christ. And it's more than that we, that we can be personally, internally saved, but that you want to give us a good life right here, right now. That you want to give us something that we can hold on to and hold up and proudly say, this is what God has done. God, we pray that, that we can point to those victories, that we can point to, to that and say, this is how God is moving in the world. Would you like to join me? 
We pray all of this in your name. Amen. If you would please